Well, I'm glad you're all here this morning and very grateful some of you are tuning in online. We welcome all of you. We're in a time that I am referring to, that I believe God has put on my heart and that is literally happening right now, is a time of a divine reset in the church. Um, I would encourage you not to have preconceived ideas about what that divine reset is all about. I've, I've explained some of that and I won't go over that now, but I believe it's a time of divine reset. Now, and, and here's what God is attempting to do. He, he is attempting to do this, to bring this about, to prepare us for the days ahead. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, for our own protection and well-being. God wants His children and His church to be well. He wants His church to be safe. And number two, it's for greater effectiveness. I, I think most of you would agree with me that things in our world have changed. Can we all say, yes, it has. If you do not agree with that, where have you been? It's changed in our world, and God wants the church to be effective. The church is the answer. Now, in the previous segment of our series, I talked about knowing your enemy. We've got to know our enemy. Now, today, near the end of this message, I'm going to, I'm going to begin a new phase called knowing your protection. Now, I intended to begin that immediately in this message today. Uh, how many of you have ever heard the term, pump the brakes? If you have ever been riding my bumper on this highway out here, as I'm journeying to Mineola and you're going to Walmart or wherever and you're on my bumper, you'll know exactly what I mean by that. Pump the brakes. In other words, get off of me. Now, I don't think the Lord, when He said, I want you just to momentarily pump the brakes... I don't think that was kind of what he had in mind, but I thought it was a great illustration. I hope none of you have ever followed me on this highway and gotten real close to me while you're operating your phone. I will pump the brakes. But I just want to take a few more moments, because I felt like the Lord said there's, there's a few more people that need to hear some thoughts about knowing your enemy. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18 says, Finally, my brethren, Paul is wrapping up his letter. He is concluding his thoughts. He said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. That's where our strength is. It's in the Lord and in the power of His might. The uh, Amplified Classic, verse 10 says, In conclusion, be strong in the Lord, be empowered through your union with Him, Draw your strength from Him, that strength which is boundless that it, might, that it provides. But my favorite is the Living Bible. It says this in verse 10, Last of all, I want to remind you that your strength must come from the Lord's mighty power uh, within. That's where our strength is, folks. It's not in my intellect. Thank God for our intellect. We need to be growing intellectually and getting smarter every day. Amen need to be growing in knowledge. But our strength to live this life and to be what God needs us to be in this moment in time comes from within, from the spirit man. He continues in verse 11, he says, Put on the whole armor of God. Who, who has to put it on? We do, I do, you do. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the schemes of the devil. He goes on to say, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up. Who's, who's to take it up? I think Paul's making a point here. It's my responsibility to take up, he says, the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. He's, he's reiterating these things. I believe we're in an evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, listen now, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Praying always 
with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Don't, don't pray alone. Pray with the help of the Holy Spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now listen, we could go and break those words down. We'll do a little bit about that. But I'm going to tell you, Paul's trying to get the, the, the Ephesian church attention. I mean, he's, he's saying a lot of things there. There's a lot of verbs there. There's, I, I mean, there, there are, he, he's making some very pointed statements. Now, I'm going to make a very clear statement. And I think most of God's people are getting it now. I think we are. I think we're finally awakening. But we are living in a war zone. Again, for anyone who might not know, that, that what you're seeing in America and what you've been seeing is not just politics. It's not a bunch of rude people, just though they are rude, arguing and debating things and saying very derogatory things of one another. It is a war that we are in. It is a spiritual war. And listen, we, we, we can be victorious in the middle of it if we'll do what Paul said. One New Testament scholar said, It is, of course, a surprise to many people that there is a struggle at all. Yes, they think we find it difficult from time to time to practice our Christianity. We find it hard to forgive people, to pray regularly, to resist temptation, to learn more about the faith. But as far as they are concerned, that's the end of it. They have never thought that their smaller struggles might be a part of a larger campaign. A lot of these little things are uh, 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 designed from a bigger campaign. In other words, this war that we are in is satanic. What we just saw demonstrated in America leading up to the presidential election, I saw a lot of satanic things happening. I heard a lot of satanic things said. They were satanic. It's a war. And Satan is attempting, was attempting, and still will try to take this nation, but the church is not going to let him do it. Can I hear a rousing amen? Yeah. Now, people don't want to believe in the devil anymore. That, that, I mean, that's being proven. Even many people who say that they're Christians do not believe in the reality of Satan. But Satan is the most bitter enemy of God and his people. Now, even his name and the names of, uh, of the devil tell us about his nature. For example, uh, Revelation 12 and 9 says he's the deceiver. John 8 and 44 says he's the murderer. We got to get this straight. Matthew 4 and 3 says he's the tempter. He will come and tempt you and try to lure you into something. And then if you succumb to it, then he'll just beat your brains out and tell you how low down you are. You, you got to get sick and tired of being sick and tired and lured into this stuff. Revelation 9 11 says he's the destroyer. What a job description. John 8 44, he's the liar. Revelation 12 and 10, the accuser of the brethren. 1 John 5, 19, the evil one. Now, I've, I've said this before in this series, and I'm going to say it one more time. Peter gave us a very sobering warning in his first epistle. Here's what he said. He said, be sober. Be sober. Be alert. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 and 8. It's a war, folks. It's real. And passivity will get you in trouble today. By the way, when we were singing the song, you got a lion in you. How about, how about Lucas? He got it down there real low. I felt, I felt like a lion by red roar. <laughs> Loved it, Lucas. Y'all, were any of you thinking like me, I'm starting to feel like a lion. I can't get quite that low, but... <clears throat> Now, I want us again to look at Paul's list of categories in reference to our enemies. Here's, here's what he said. Principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. In other words, they're in the heavenlies. This is nothing less than the organizational chart of Satan's dominion. The forces of evil in this world are led by Satan. 
And he has a great army of fallen angels called demons that are well organized into a hierarchy. Each of those terms tell us something. See, this has been one of the mistakes of the church. Well, the devil, uh, he's been, God pulled all his teeth out. He hasn't got any power or anything. Yes, he does. If the church doesn't rise... And we don't take our rightful place with Christ being the head and we, 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 we represent Christ in the earth. Yes, He does. I'm kind of getting a little weary of some of that passivity teaching. It's a war. Satan's out to kill you. And he will do it. And then he will tell you God did it. God did it. Satan is the one who kills people. Let's get the record straight. He kills, steals, and destroys. This is his organizational chart. Here he is, principalities. These are his head officers, if you will. Think of it in army terms. The powers describe staff officers. Rulers are divisional commanders. And spiritual hosts of wickedness are rank-and-file minions are demons. I was talking to somebody the other day about demons and uh, again, people give me this funny look and I say, well, where do people think the demons went that were in the days of Jesus we read about? And they, they kind of look at you like, well, I don't know. They're here! <clears throat> Calm down, Pastor. I'm ready for the church to get motivated, man. And, and, and this church is, don't get me wrong. I'm not scolding you today. John Phillips notes how carefully Paul defines our enemy. Our enemies are not real people. We must see beyond people. Satan may use people to persecute us, lie to us, cheat us, hurt us, or even kill us. But our real enemy lurks in the shadows of the unseen world, moving people as pawns on the chessboard of time. As long as we see people as the enemies and wrestle against them, we will spend our strength in vain. And that is exactly what he wants us to do. Get distracted and struggle with one another. Come on, church on the rock. Thank God we're not struggling against one another. Amen. And don't you dare let the enemy get to talking to you and get you all stirred up, get you frustrated so we can, we can lose sight of the real battle and start struggling against one another. Amen. We're going to get along here. And we're going to be unified. And we're going to move together as one, one unit toward the enemy. Now, we've talked about the fact how this Satan is a strategist. Paul said this. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, but we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan has a lot of devices, and he is tireless. He doesn't give up like, a, like we do sometimes. I'm tired. I know the feeling. I know what exhaustion is from time to time. How about you? Some of you, uh, many of you, living in what we've been living in will exhaust you. And then mix in a few family issues and a little business issue here and there. And hey, you've got, you got some challenges. The word for devices in this verse is translated everywhere else in the New Testament as mind. The phrase here means that Satan has a very well thought out plan for each of us. He attacks us in a mindful way. He does. He does. We win if we stay the course. The Bible says Satan's purpose is to hurt and discourage those who belong to God. He will stop at nothing to disturb the mind, deceive the heart, and defeat the life. If you read the Bible carefully, you will see that what he is doing today, he has done from the very beginning. Now, since there's not time, I, I could go in and show you a dozen examples of how Satan was working in the past, in the Bible, just like he's been working today. It is no different. Did you know that the devil has three primary goals? Three primary goals. Here they are. Number one, to destroy the testimony of Christian individuals. He wants to destroy your testimony. 
And if you've blown it, ask God to forgive you, repent of it, and move on. Here's the second one, to destroy the unity and purity of the Christian home. He's been working hard to destroy the, the, the home in America and the Christian home. Folks, without the home, you ain't got anything. That is the first institution, far above government, by the way, and God established the family. Why do you think the family's being attacked so strongly today? Why all these crazy things? Why, why all these things that are pitting parents against children, and we're going to do this to your child, and as a parent, you have no right uh, to know what we're doing. I tell you what, any parent that put up with that needs, mm, 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 don't you put up with that. If you live in a state that belongs in it, pack your bags, be like the hillbillies, get your car, and move somewhere else. we got enough people here in Texas, by the way, right now. Yeah. Don't you bring into that craziness to Texas. We're getting, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting a little rowdy here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Amen. Anyway, I better leave that alone. <laughs> here, here's the third thing he wants to do. He wants to destroy the ministry of Christian churches or the Christian church. That's the reason we confront things pretty quick here when, when a little, <laughs> which we had not had any of that in years because the devil knows we're not going to put up with it. We're going to do what the Bible says. By the way, let me just say this as a way of instruction. If you get bent out of shape with somebody, you go to them and them alone. Just like the Bible says, don't call me, go to them. And, well, what if, it, what if it's against you, Pastor? Go to somebody else and <laughs> take it to your dog or something. <laughs> Pardon? Take it, to the take it to the throne, not the phone. That's my wife's philosophy, to take it to the throne. Go, go to that person individually. Talk it out. Bible says if that doesn't work, find, find another objective party to go with you, not somebody who's going to side with you and beat them up. And y'all have a talk, get that thing worked out. And then if they don't listen, he says, take it to the leadership of the church. We'll try to deal with it. But if nobody listens, we'll just stand right up here and we'll have court in church and get it dealt with. Amen. Oh, everybody got quiet and looked kind of stunned. That's the Bible. That's how you keep the devil out of your church, preachers. We're going to deal with it biblically. That's what the Bible says. That's what he says. Everybody with me on that? Here's the frightening thing about spiritual warfare. Most Christians are not serious about it or haven't been if they even acknowledge it at all. Let me put it this way. I think if we really understood what was going on, the prayer meetings would be a lot more attended than they are. Yeah. You heard the few, the remnant say, yeah. Uh, John Eldridge said, to live in ignorance of spiritual warfare is the most naive and dangerous thing a person can do. It's like skipping through the worst part of town late at night, waving your wallet above your head. It's like walking into an Al-Qaeda training camp wearing a I love the United States t-shirt. <laughs> Pastor Sam Walker can tell you a story. We don't know how, and we learned our lesson, but we ended up in some kind of Al-Qaeda thing in Pakistan, and I don't know how in God's green earth we got there. But thank God Sam Walker got us out of it. There's a whole nother story. If you're in trouble in Pakistan, you want Sam with you. It's like swimming with great white sharks dressed as a wounded sea lion and smeared with blood. And let me tell you something. He continues. I'm going to let him say this. You don't escape spiritual warfare simply because you choose not to believe it exists or believe uh, 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 because you refuse to fight it. That's been the problem. That's the reason a lot of Christians right now in America are just down and out. They, uh, Satan got them. They went for it and they're, and they're now moaning and a lot of them are blaming somebody else and the government and family and friends and partners. No! The bottom line is this. 
You're going to have to fight for your heart today. You're going to have to fight for your heart. Remember what John 10.10 says? It, It tells us that the thief is trying to steal the life that God wants you to have. So now everybody, I think, has a fairly good idea of who our enemy is. If y'all will say amen real big, I'll move on. Oh, I can tell some of you want me to keep preaching that way, I can tell. We better try that again. All right. Today, and I'm only going to spend a few moments on this, I'm going to begin this portion of our teaching entitled, Knowing Your Protection. Knowing Your Protection. Now, in order to be victorious over or against Satan's strategies and devices, we must put on the whole armor of God. In other words, in this fight we're in, in this war and battle, uh, spiritual weapons are required. Spiritual weapons. I know some of you carry, and that's great. I'm licensed. <laughs> I didn't say whether I carry or not. Um, (laughs) But we're talking spiritual. Verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the schemes of the devil. I already talked about that. But but, but here's the scene that I envision. You've got to understand, Paul's in prison. By the way, just a little side note that I hopefully will encourage you. If you're going through some hardships or some trials, let me tell you, it's believed by uh, scholars that if Paul had not been in prison, we probably would not have two-thirds of the New Testament. Because Paul had no choice but there in prison to just sit there and write those letters. So sometimes we go through things and we think, uh, why am I going through this? Well, sometimes God can't get us to do what we need to do, so we go through some things we'd rather not go through to get us to the next level. Come on! I think if we'd listen, things would be alright. But I envision Paul in this prison cell. If you've ever been to Rome, you can go and tour what they believe is the cell he was in. It was kind of a sewer dump, really. And I envision Paul sitting in prison there one day uh, with this guard, chained to this guard. It indicates that he at times was chained to these guards. And all of a sudden he's sitting there thinking and he gets this insight and this understanding about what it means to be a Christian and how you live above and, 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 and win the battle that you're in, uh, these strategies against the devil. And suddenly he has a revelation. He's sitting there looking at that Roman soldier. How many of you know Roman soldiers were decked out to win and be victorious in battle? Again, I know I mentioned this, but verse 13 says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Not just a part of it. Not just a piece of it. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. Verse 14. Stand therefore. Having girded your waist with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The first piece of armor that Paul mentions is the belt of truth. The belt of truth. He says, stand therefore, having uh, girded your waist with truth. Now, Paul begins with truth because that is Satan's primary target. From the Garden of Eden to our current culture, Satan has trafficked deception and lies. Now, Jesus describes the devil's character to a T. Here's what he said in John 8, 44, and he's actually speaking to some of the religious people of the day. Church on the Rock doesn't have any religious people. They're out there somewhere. But he says, you are of the father of the devil. How how would you like that if I stood up and said, some of you, you're of the father, you're the devil. You're you're of your father, the devil. Would y'all get goosebumps? No. Well, you're not, so I don't have to do that. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Satan can't stand truth, and he won't be around it. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, from his own being. For he is a liar and the father of it. Every lie that you have ever heard, experienced, or maybe even, God forbid, told, came from Satan. Well, okay, I'll amen myself on that one. 
William Gall wrote, The devil has more temptations than an actor has costumes for the stage. And one of his all-time favorite disguises is that of a lying spirit to abuse your tender heart with the worst news that he can deliver. That you do not really love Jesus Christ and that you are only pretending you are only deceiving yourself. That's the big lie he tells a lot of people. That's the reason a lot of Christians don't have great confidence in, in the Lord and in their walk with the Lord because they hear these lies, well, you're not a very good Christian. Who is? What makes us good? God makes us good. Jesus makes us good. Now again, I, I'm, not, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying, okay, all right, then, then I can go do anything I want to and I, I, I can cop out on my excuses. That's not the Bible. Right? The piece of the armor that deflects Satan's lie is the belt of truth. Truth is always the answer for lies. A person of integrity with a clear conscience can face the enemy without fear. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of truth, hangs from the belt. A person of truth who speaks the truth, listen very carefully, will win against Satan every time. Are you listening to me? But once a lie gets into the heart of the believer, everything starts falling apart. Let me tell you something. Anytime you allow a lie to live in your heart or your soul, you are giving a foothold to Satan. Why? Because that's his dominion. Don't do it. Are there such things as a white lies? No. You know why you shouldn't do it? Because that is his domain. Don't cheat on your spouse by either thought or deed. And all the husbands said, Amen. Amen. Don't cheat on your expense account. Oh, it's just $100. You open in the door. Don't cheat on your expense account. Don't say things that you know are not true. I would sit and watch some of these things going on in this election and leading up to it. I, I, I would fall down on my knees and say, God, if you let that wicked lie run this nation... I don't know what I'm going to do. I've never seen such demonic, blatant, demonic times 42 lying. And it was disgraceful. And God happened to agree with His church and said, I'm going to have mercy on you. You know why we shouldn't do this? Because each time you give yourself to dishonesty, or I give myself to it, you walk in the domain of the enemy, and you give him free reign in your life. If you, listen, I say it, and I say it very generically, folks. Listen, we're all at different places in our walk with God. But if you know better than to do something, and you're just fine, and you're still doing it anyway, and God says, we've got to get this down, and you're still doing it, you've got an open door to the devil. You know, the new word is a portal. You, you've just opened the door. Come in and... and, and Badger me, Satan, because he can. Why? Because somebody else has done you wrong, and if they do this, and you hadn't done that. I'm, I'm, I'm so weary of people blaming others for their stuff. That, oh, I wanted to say something else. Stuff, their stuff. You know. You know what we need to do instead? Put on the belt of truth. You've got to know the truth of God's Word. You can't just be inoculated with it. You live truthfully. You have integrity in your life. But everybody's doing it. I don't care what everybody's doing. And by the way, not everybody is doing it. There are still a lot of honest people in America. When what seems like a little lie starts to tickle your mind, stand up and say no. But I, I'm so weak. 
Stand up and say to God, give me your grace. Approach His throne of grace that you might receive help and mercy in your time of need. And don't sit there and let that thing tickle too long. Change the TV quick. Good Lord, I was trying to find something just to kind of relax on last night. I went to, you know, there's some channels you used to could watch. I mean, some of these old movie shows, I flipped over to one and I was like, Dear Jesus! <laughs> Satan wanted to tickle my brain. Shoot, I went back to the news after that. I thought, this, is, this, this negative news is better than that. <sighs> That's a joke. People loosen up a little bit. Folks, we not only acknowledge the truth, but we live the truth. As Christians, we live the truth. Do we mess up some? Yeah. Do we stumble? Yes. But for the most part, we live the truth. And we gird up our loins with the truth. And we lay aside every besetting sin. We get rid of them, folks. It's time. It's time. My God. God, I'm so tired of some of this stuff. And here are these weak preachers. I love preachers, and I have to be careful what I say. Don't be afraid to preach the truth. We renounce these things. We put on truth. We gird up our loins, as Paul said, with the truth. And we lay aside every besetting sin. Paul, uh, the writer of Hebrews, said that. And we hold our ground against the enemy. And you know, right where we began, how do you do all these things? It starts by knowing God. Start by knowing God. How do you know God? Well, you don't, you don't do a lot of good deeds. What you do is you acknowledge as the Bible says, I'm, I'm, I've come up short. Now, I'm going to ask no moving here for a few moments. I've come up short. Now, the Bible calls it sin. I, I didn't have time for church, so when somebody told me you're a sinner, I said, you're exactly right. <laughs> I just knew. And God had been convicting me of what sin was. It, you come to that place and say, I need a Savior for what I need. I've got some problems, and I need a Savior. I, I, I couldn't get out of what I was in. I could make a New Year's resolution, and it lasted for 30 minutes. I just knew there were some issues. And there was more than anything else, there was this void, this emptiness. And thank God for people who introduced me to Jesus. They were radical people. Thank God for radical Christians. Who weren't afraid to be around radical sinners. No intimidation whatsoever. And they convinced me that I needed a Savior. And it didn't take long. I was ready. And I said, Jesus, and this is, it's this simple. Come into my heart. I repent of my sins. And I will follow you from this day forward. And I've done the very best to do that. I did not know that two weeks after my salvation, God would call me to be a preacher. I had no idea. But here I am, quite a few years later. Whew, <laughs> help us, Lord. <laughs> It all starts by knowing Jesus Christ. Let's stand this morning. Romans says if you believe in Jesus Christ, that He is the Savior, and you confess Him as Lord of your life, you'll be saved. It really is that simple. And I was ready, and if you're ready, we're going to pray a simple prayer together. And there's going to be people here at the front if you want to come and have them pray with you. They'll give you a little booklet. There's no catch. There's no conditions. You come to Jesus. You're coming to Jesus as Lord and Savior. This little booklet that we want to get in your hands called What is Your Next Step? We've got a, uh, we're, we're changing over to another cover. So if you see one with another cover, um, that's okay. There are some things you'll need to do next. 
and remind me to talk about water baptism in just a moment. But let's pray. If you want to receive Christ, those of you who are watching this today and you're saying, I don't know. Let's get the doubt out. You need, you need to make sure there is a, a, a divine uh, thing happening by God right now. And He is inviting everybody. It's a time of grace and everyone who will is invited. You haven't done too much that God will not welcome you and glad to have you in His family, but you have to come through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. I'm going to ask all of us together in this room to pray. There's some of you, maybe you're watching this, you're in your bedroom. I don't know where you're at. Hopefully you're not driving your car, but if you are, maybe you're in a cafe. Wherever you are, in your office, cubicle, just pray with us. Pray this way. Say, Dear God, I give you my heart. I confess that I have sinned, but I will follow you from this day forward. Be my Savior and my Lord. Show me the way, and I will follow in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, folks, let me tell you, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, the next step is water baptism. Now, now what is water baptism? By the way, you, you can be seated for just a moment. Water baptism is your symbolic, it's symbolic of your death in Christ and your resurrection as a new person. Now, what just happened if you prayed that prayer? Every sin you ever committed, I don't care how dark, how dastardly it was, it was immediately forgiven by God. Washed by the blood of Jesus. And you are free. And you are clean before God. And you don't have to be ashamed before your Father. But the next step, you show that you're a Christian now by being water baptized. Believe it or not, we have a baptistry right here. Have we set next Sunday, uh, next Sunday uh, uh, at the end of service, we're going to have, we've got two young ladies that are going to be baptized. You're going to be blessed to see them. And... If, hey, if you've just come to Christ, or listen, folks, some people come to us from time to time and say, you know what, I was baptized as a child, but I didn't really understand. I want to be baptized again. That's, that's great. That's great. You know, when Trace and I went to Israel, we could have been baptized in the River Jordan. My wife, she wanted to. I, I, I didn't. Mine was so precious to me. Seven miles, or a few miles out of town out here in Maranatha Retreat Center. But if you feel a need, you feel a call of God, let's do it. So make sure. Why don't, why don't you do this? Why don't you come to Miss Tracy and let her know if you're going to do that so we'll make sure we're prepared and can get you some information. But that's the next step. And then you need to, listen, start talking to God. Don't worry about it, how it sounds. You just talk to God from your heart. When you first come to the Lord God, He understands everything about us. Start reading the Bible. We've got all kinds of Bibles. We'll get you a New Believer's Bible. Uh, we'll give you one if you need one. Uh, and then get in a church. Find a church. Those of you who are watching, get in a church. This is a time to be in church. It's not a time to be out of church. And we'll help you every way we possibly can. Amen? Amen. Well, immediately after uh, this video we're going to see regarding uh, Veterans Day, there will be people standing right here that you can come. They'll pray with you and give you this resource. Listen, if you're, if you're exploring your walk with God, grab one of these little booklets on your way out and may it be a help to you. All right, everybody, as soon as the video is over, you can be dismissed. God bless all of you. Have a great weekend.